Okay. Hey there, guys. It is uh, the end of the story that we are coming to today here in grade 12 college. So, <clears throat> like we were talking about yesterday, Sherlock Holmes has set a trap. A trap for the infamous criminal Stapleton here. And he is using Sir Henry as the bait for his trap. Right, so the plot is have Sir Henry walk home through the moor, nice and exposed, ready for uh, Stapleton to send his dog out at him. And, uh, you know, it sort of gives him the perfect opportunity here, right? And they, in the meanwhile, have pretended to go back to London, right? So Stapleton will think, ah, oh, Sherlock Holmes is gone. <clears throat> I can just kill this guy and get it over with and get my money. So, um, <clears throat> they bring in Lestrade, who I hope you all remember from the Six Napoleons, right? The uh, detective or inspector guy from Scotland Yard, right? From London. So they've got an actual police officer there, and <clears throat> they are armed. So the idea is very simple. Uh, they wait for the dog to attack Sir Henry, and uh, they will then get rid of the stock, right? So, uh, let's see. Uh, this is in chapter 14. Hist, cried Holmes, and I heard the sharp clicking of a cocking pistol. Look out, it's coming. There's a thin, crisp, continuous patter from somewhere in the heart of that crawling back, the cloud within 15 yards of where we lay, and we glared at it, all three uncertain what horror was to break from the heart of it. I was at Helm's elbow, and I glanced for an instant at his face. It was pale and exalted, his eyes shining brightly in the moonlight. But suddenly they started forward in a rigid, fixed stare, and his lips parted in amazement. At the same instant... Lestrade gave a yell of terror and threw himself face downward upon the ground. I sprang to my feet, my inert his hand grasping my pistol, my mind paralyzed by the dreadful shape which had sprung out upon us from the shadows of, of the fog. A hound it was, an enormous coal-black hound, <clears throat> but not such a hound as mortal eyes have ever seen. Fire burst from its mouth. Its eyes glowed with a smoldering glare. Its muzzles and hackles and dewlap were outlined in flickering flame. Never in the delirious dream of a disordered brain could anything more savage, more appalling, more hellish be conceived than that dark form and savage face which bro brought up broke upon us out of the wall of fog, right? So, you got a dog here with this barking, and there's fire coming out of the dog, right? So, if we want to go back to that supernatural issue, right, that we talked about before, right, the dog appears to be supernatural, right, because, you know, uh, I don't think there are many dogs that can breathe fire. With long bounds, the huge black creature was leaping down the track, following hard upon the footsteps of our friend. So paralyzed were we by the apparition that we allowed him to pass before we had recovered our nerve. Then Holmes and I fired together, and the creature gave a hideous howl which showed that at least one, one at least had hit him. He did not pause, however, but bounded outward, far away from the path we saw Sir Henry looking back, his face white in the moonlight, his hands raised in horror, glaring helplessly at the frightful thing which was hunting him down. But that cry of pain from the hound had blown all our fears to the winds. If he was vulnerable, he was mortal, and if we could wound him, then we could kill him. Never have I seen a man run as Holmes ran that night. I reckon, I am reckon fleet of foot, but he outpaced me as much as I outpaced the little professional. In front of us, as we flew up the track, we heard scream after scream from Sir Henry and the deep roar of the hound. I was in time to see the base spring upon his victim, hurl him up to the ground and worry at his throat. But the next instant, Holmes had emptied five barrels of his revolver into the creature's flank. With the last howl of agony and a vicious snap in the air, it rolled upon its back, four feet pawing furiously, and then fell limp upon its side. I stooped, panting, and pressed my pistol to the dreadful, shimmering head. But it was useless to press the trigger. The great giant howl was dead. So, they shoot this thing, they find that they can hurt it, and then they kill it. So, uh, this evil devil hound is now dead. <clears throat> And we get an explanation 
for the fire, right? Um, it says just in the next paragraph here, in mere strength, size and strength, there was a terrible creature which was lying stretched before us. It was not a pure bloodhound, and it was not a pure mastiff, but it appeared to be a combination of the two, gaunt, savage, and lar as large as a small lioness. Even now, in the stillness of death, the huge jaws seemed to be dripping with a bluish flame, and the same deep-set cruel eyes were ringed with fire. I placed my hand upon the glowing muzzle, and as I held them up, my own fingers smoldered and gleamed in the darkness. Phosphorus, I said. A cutting preparation of it, said Holmes, sniffing at the dead animal. There is no smell which might have interfered with his power of scent. We owe you a deep apology, Sir Henry, for having exposed you to this fright. <clears throat> so, uh, phosphorus is something that they use in things like fireworks, right? So essentially the thing had like a sparkling firework thing in his mouth, right? Um, so the dog was not a devil dog. And we see that the conclusion of this particular story is that, um, you know, there is no supernatural explanation. It's all about um, uh, the rational explanation, right? So it's not a devil dog. It's just a uh, normal dog that someone put a... Uh, you know, sparkling thing in to make it look like it had fire breath, right? So there's no supernatural aspect here, and they have now killed the dog. Meow. See, I was right. The dog was there, and the dog is bad. I'm glad that it is gone. It's not the dog's fault. It was trained to do that. Meow. No, dog, bad. Hmm. Okay, well, that's the cat perspective on this issue. But, nevertheless, uh, we are now at uh, what could be considered the climax of this story, right? Because at this point, uh, there's just one last matter to uh, deal with, and that is uh, arresting Stapleton himself. So, um, from this point forward, it's just a matter of wrapping up a couple of loose ends. Uh, we find out, for instance, that... Uh, the reason those boots were going missing was so that uh, Stapleton could use them to give the scent to the dog, right? And get it to attack um, Henry, right? So that's why. By the way, it's I just noticed right now, um, here we are just at the end of chapter 14. Once only we saw a trace that someone uh, had passed through that per perilous way before us. Among the tuft of craft and gas, which bore it out, uh, up out of the slime, some dark thing was projecting. Holmes sank to his waist as he stepped from the path to seize it. And had we not been there to drag him out, he could have never set a foot upon firm land again. He held an old black boot in the air. Mayor's Toronto was printed on the leather inside. So by the way, st um, Henry's, you know, he's from North America, but it seems like he spent time in Toronto. Right, so that's kind of cool. Anyway, uh, is worth a mud bath, said he. It is our friend Sir Henry's missing boot, thrown there by Stapleton in his flight. Exactly, he retained it in his hand after using it to set the hound upon the track. He fled when he knew the game was up, still clutching it, and he hurled it away at this point of his flight. We know at least that he came so far in safety. So, uh, Stapleton here is at the end of his rope. He can only run away, but Holmes has, uh, essentially got him. In the final chapter, chapter 15, right, which is, uh, the end of the story, uh, Holmes sort of explains it all, right, uh, and sort of ties up all the la loose ends, right? He tells us, uh, this is in chapter 5, 15, my inquiry show beyond all question that the family portrait did not lie, and that this fellow was indeed a Baskerville. He was a son of that Roger Baskerville, the younger brother of Sir Charles, who fled with a sinister reputation to South America, where he said he was said to have died unmarried. He did, as a matter of fact, marry and had one child, this fellow, whose real name is the same as his father's. His name, he married Beryl de Garcia, one of the beauties of Costa Rica, and having purloined a considerable sum of public money, he changed his name to Vandeleur, and fled to England, where he established a school in the east of Yorkshire. His reason for attempting, attempting this line, special line of business was that he had struck up an acquaintance with a consumptive tutor upon the voyage home, and he had used this man's ability to under, make the undertaking a success. 
Fraser, the tutor, died, however, and the school had begun, which had begun well, sank into dis from disrepute into infamy. The Vandalers found it convenient to change their name to Stapleton, and he brought the remains of his fortune, his schemes for the future, and his ta taste for entomology to the south of England. I learned at the British Museum that he was a recognized authority upon the subject, and the name Vandalure has been permanently attached to a certain mouth, which he had, in his Yorkshire days, been the first to describe. So, Holmes here is sort of confirming what we knew already. So, Stapleton's real name was Roger, and the whole idea was to get at the money, right? So, this is uh, the part of the story where Holmes sort of ties up everything uh, with a little bow here, right? Sort of going through the fact that he uh, was pretending to have his sister be his, or sorry, pretending to have his wife be his sister so that he could go around and make connections with people like Laura Lyon. Uh, he was going after Sir Charles Baskerville first so that he could get his, uh, at that inheritance, right? So, Everything uh, is sort of tied up here at the end, right? Um, and again, Canada is mentioned, right? So again, I didn't really realize until I reread it just now that Henry was in fact Canadian, right? So he's uh, one of our countrymen here uh, that Sherlock has been um, protecting. But nevertheless, right, uh, Stapleton is here... Uh, thoroughly foiled. Now, one last thing. So, again, this whole last bit of the story is sort of meant to summarize what has happened, uh, conclude uh, all of the loose ends, right, and sort of tie those loose ends, right? Um, we learn one more thing about our female character, right, Mrs. Stapleton, which is that she was not actually in on the crime uh at the end, right? Um, Sherlock Holmes tells us in just right before the end, on the day of the crisis, however, his wife suddenly turned against him. She had learned something of the death of the convict, and she knew that the hound was being kept in the house on the evening that Sir Henry was coming to dinner. She taxed her husband with his attended crime, and a furious scene followed in which he showed her for the first time that she had a rival in his love. Her fidelity turned in an instant to bitter hatred, and he saw that she would betray him. He tied her up, therefore, that she would have no chance of warning Sir Henry, and he hoped, no doubt, that the whole countryside would put the, down the baronet's death to the curse of the, his family, as they certainly would do, and he could win his wife back, back, to an accomplished, back to accept an accomplished fact and to keep silent upon what she knew. Right, so, um, Mrs. Stapleton is not part of the crime in the end, right? And here's an important part, especially for those of you uh, who are aiming high and are attempting question four of the uh, four essay questions that I've given you. Because Holmes says a little thing, right? Let's see. In this fact, I fancy that in any case he made a miscalculation and that if he had not been there, his doom would nonetheless have been sealed. A woman of Spanish blood does not condone such an injury so lightly. So, uh, that, you know, Holmes says, a woman of Spanish blood, hmm, uh, does not condone such an injury uh, so easily, right? And what he means is, uh, she, you know, uh, by injury, uh, he means the the fact that uh, Stapleton was flirting with uh, Roger. Oh, how am I saying like the Rogers is his name with Laura Lyons, right? So first of all, let's deal with the Spanish part, right? So that's a stereotype right there. It's a very old stereotype. Which, which is that Spanish women uh, are very passionate, right, and uh, emotional. But let's take it a step back from there, right? Uh, because I didn't give as a topic uh, racism in um, Hound of the Baskervilles. If you want to do that anyway, by the way, you could, right, if you are interested in that subject, right? There is a little bit, but... Not too much, right? Because, I mean, there's this line and there's a line earlier on by 
uh, Dr. Mortimer, but there's not too much racism in this book, right? Because, well, I'll just, I'll, the whole class is English white, uh, other than Miss Stapleton. Anyway, let me, let's get on to the woman thing. So, again, the idea here is that women act based on their emotions, right? Uh, so, you know, she didn't have a problem with, um, you know, the whole let's get an inheritance thing, let's have you pretend to be my sister thing, right? So she didn't have a problem with that stuff. What she did have a problem with was her husband flirting with another woman, right? With uh, having a rival in love, as Sherlock said, right? So uh, that's a fairly, with the exception of one character in one of the stories, consistent thing through all of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's work, right? So, or, so Arthur Conan Doyle often has women act like this, right? You know, uh, they act based on their feelings and emotions and their hearts rather than their heads, right? So, you know, Sherlock Holmes, you, there's no question that he was going to, like, freak out because his partner is uh, flirting with someone else. In fact, Sherlock Holmes doesn't even have a uh, partner at all, right? So uh, that's where we see, again, that conflict play out in the story, right? Where you have males, right, who are... Again, assuming the mantle of rationality, reason, uh, deduction, right? Uh, going by the evidence, right? You've got the men doing that. And then you have women who are, you know, irrational, going by emotion and, you know, uh, following their feelings, right? So that's very much well, the way that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle saw the world, right? And uh, again, there are very few empowered uh, female characters in the stories. So in tomorrow's Google meeting, right, um, we'll ask the question, first, does the solution to the mystery make sense? So if you guys don't understand anything from the end of the book, feel free to ask, right? Uh, we'll ask about what makes the story a page turner for those of you who are picking that question. Uh, we'll ask what about the motivation of Stapleton, why do people act so desperately when it comes to money, and finally we'll conclude with that big question, can women be Sherlock Holmes? So, that is the plan for tomorrow, so for now, uh, guys, I hope you've enjoyed Sherlock Holmes, I hope you guys read the other short stories because they are wonderful, and uh, I hope that, uh, you know, uh, your essays go well. So I will look forward to talking with all of you tomorrow, and I will see you all next time. So, uh, as you answer uh, your, or if you pick question four, which again, you know, I really hope people go for that one, because that's the harder question. Uh, that one, that's sort of what we're looking about, uh, looking at there, right? Women, uh, especially in this particular story, uh, don't get to be as cool as Sherlock Holmes, right? They don't get to have any of those qualities. Instead, again, theirs are sort of relegated to the realm of emotions and feelings and all of that, right? While Holmes is the one that gets to solve the mysteries and everything like that, right? So that is definitely something uh, you can discuss, right? And I'm eager to hear some perspectives on that. But nevertheless, uh, at this point, the story is over, right? We've got Stapleton in jail. The dog is gone. Uh, Mr. Sir Henry is okay. Uh, maybe Sir Henry will end up marrying, um, what's her real name? Mrs. Stapleton, right? She's, uh, you know, available now, so she can. But uh, nevertheless, um, you know, the story ends with... Uh, Holmes and Watson going off to see a play and have dinner, right? So that is uh, the way things come to an end. And at this point, uh, the story, again, is done. So tomorrow we are to have our very final um, 
Google Meetup for this class, right, where we will be talking about the ending and what's going uh, on there, right? And, well, let me give you some topics.